So I don't know if you guys still do this or not, but in my day, we had to write letters or get letters of recommendation to submit to colleges. Uh, so in my day, we needed three. Uh, so I asked one of my teachers, Nelson Camp, to write one for me. And in it, he wrote, Chris has the natural ability to connect, uh, Chris shows natural ability for empathy and has the ability to connect and feel for others. And I had no idea what he meant. And in fact, I don't even think I had heard the word empathy before. But uh, I felt very honored, and it sounded very adult-like, so I took it. And I spent the next 30 years trying to figure out what it all meant. But I finally have a handle on it. Empathy, and by result, compassion, is the emotional connection to someone else's problem and thereby a drive to find a solution. Problem, solution. Growing up, I was always the problem child in my family. One of six, middle child, same astrological sign as my father, you get the picture. I was constantly in trouble and it usually re revolved around me doing the things that my father asked me not to do. Uh, on many occasions, he'd say uh, just how stubborn he thought I was. Hard-headed, I think, was the term. And then if I continued down this path, I'd have a very hard life in front of me. And well, you guessed it. He was right. The misconception about being the problem child is that you are far from the problem. The issue is typically about wanting to be someone other than the role you've been given to play. I was acting out, that's for sure. But I wanted to be noticed for who I was without a clue on how to get there. I was trying to be someone else and I didn't have the tools to know how to do it. And so as time went on, I got more and more defeated, more and more reserved, and more and more angry. And it all became this sort of self-fulfilling prophecy that I was that problem child, just now lost and what I presumed to be depressed. My father was a single parent, divorced, and raising six kids while running his hardware store in a small town outside of New Orleans. We were all made to work there as kids, uh, after school and of course every weekend. We would do our homework on a blackboard that he had mounted on the staircase leading up to the warehouse where we'd use sacks of horse feed as a makeshift desk. I was a terrible student with a string of learning disabilities that only really added to my already mangled self-esteem. The thing about hardware stores is that people come there to fix things, right? a leak in a pipe, or perhaps a link in a chain, a hammer and some nails. People fix things because they have value and meaning, and because it gives them a little sense of accomplishment that they saved something that was broken. Every day in this store, there was a string of characters that would come through to pick up the odds and ends to fix whatever it is they were working on, but to also sit and have a Coke and offload the problems of the day. Money issues, family issues, politics, and of course, whatever happened at church on Sunday. But it was in these afternoons that I, that I discovered the power of empathy. Not that I knew what it meant, I didn't, but because I saw it in the way that people come together to fix one another. This is gonna be a, a rather boring story if I continue down this path, so. Uh, there is a point to all of it. So yes, I was the problem child, but I was also a dreamer as a way to escape myself and be the person who I always knew I was. Being that I had no other place to go, this hardware store became my playground. And uh, it had so many hiding places that we used to build forts and dream of being any place else. My brother and I used to sit on the warehouse dock and talk about building an airplane. It was a uh, two-seater, single engine, because we had just fixed a lawnmower engine we had out back. And this engine would take us anywhere we wanted to go. But this hardware store had an unlimited amount of possibilities, right? I mean, we could do anything, and no tool was ever off limits. 
As kids, we had to be able to identify a vice grip over a crescent wrench, uh, when to use a particular type of saw, and the difference between a three penny and a 10 penny nail. But the tools were everything. When I, was le when I graduated high school, my father didn't hand me bed sheets and towels to start my college career. He handed me a toolbox, because if I had tools, I could fix things. From a problem child to a fixer with, I'm not sure how, but enough empathy and compassion to get noticed, so my teacher said. Moving away from a small town, you begin to question and look at things a little bit differently. Uh, was I really the problem child I always was told I was, or was I just trying to figure out who I was? So under the advice of a teacher and many very dark afternoons, uh, I decided to seek help. Our college offered three free therapy sessions with resident psychology majors, and being that my only experience were these afternoons in my father's hardware store with people unloading their problems, I was like, this is easy, I should go. And I spent the first hour of the session uh, telling the therapist exactly how I had everything sort of figured out. It's amazing what we tell ourselves, right? The self-doubt, the apologies we give for having any sort of feelings or emotions. So after an hour, she said, well, I guess you don't need me. But I did need her, and I didn't have anything figured out. And it wasn't until six years later that I went back, and I found a therapist who was compassionate and empathetic and who listened to my problems and gave me advice for $20 a session because that's all I could afford. And I saw him every week for 20 years. And with that, he gave me the tools I needed to become the man I knew I was. But more importantly, he connected those tools to my understanding of empathy. I was fortunate. I reached out, I was able to get help, and that ability changed my life. But I've noticed it's not the same for everyone, that there are people out in the world who haven't been so fortunate. There's a stigma that suggests that only crazy people go to therapy. But the truth is, is that getting healthy is very lonely. And the, and the old saying goes that, if, that misery loves company, which it does. My father would have said, you don't need therapy, you need to go out, get a job, and get to work. He had this belief that we fix our problems through projects. When life gets down, you clean the garage, or you build something. Effectively fixing the things that we're in control over, uh, and the rest will follow. And so I did. I started my own creative agency called Fugitives because I think of the world a little bit differently than everyone else. And I made a career of transforming empathy into visual expressions. And so it seemed right that a nonprofit organization reached out and contacted us to help them with a mental health project. It was to tell the story of a Ghanaian man named Francis. Now Francis was, and still is, a school teacher in a small town outside of North Ghana, a productive and family-oriented man. But he was going through a really tough time, not too dissimilar from my own. And he began fighting with his wife, his kids, people in the town, falling into that rabbit hole of depression. That sounded all too familiar. He began to self-medicate, which made the problems worse, and his fighting became violent. He went to visit the town healer, who did ritualistic ceremonies and sacrifices, but they did nothing to cure his pain. So the town, in looking out for his better interest and safety, locked him in a small grass hut with a log shackled to his foot. The log was supposed to have these powers that would, for an undetermined amount of time, cure him. The log had been bored out for his foot with two nails driven on either side to keep him from pulling it out. He couldn't move outside of maybe repositioning himself from one side of his foot to the other. 
He was to live, sleep, eat, shit, everything in one small confining area. The conditions were impossible and would drive anyone crazy. Now, Ghanaian society speaks of mental illness in a way that perpetuates the stigma, and for those that suffer from it would rather stay in silence than be labeled crazy. The stigma continues to the doctors who might potentially work in the mental health field, leaving a deficit of one therapist per two million people in the city of Ghana. Some of these mental clinics are over a day's journey away, impossible for most of them to get to, and cost prohibitive with having to leave work, travel by bus, stay in a hotel overnight, only to return back again for continued treatment. According to the World Health Organization, there are more than 300 million people suffering in the world from depression, which is the leading cause of disability. And 260 million are suffering from an anxiety disorder, many of which are suffering from both. In a recent World Health Organization-led study estimates that depression and anxiety disorders cost the global economy one trillion US dollars in loss in productivity. Now, as a marketer and storyteller, I knew that we had to create a visceral reaction to the environment and conditions he lived. So immediately, we began pulling out our toolbox of options, right? And virtual reality was the perfect vehicle. Up until now, virtual reality had only been used for video games and cartoon animation, rarely a documentary. But the ability to put someone in his place in that tight, close environment was essential. And there's no better tool in the world to create empathy than VR. The headset and headphones are isolating, which create a singular experience that transform your world and give you the ability to feel what he felt. Much like uh, if you walk in a tightrope across the World Trade Center to activate your fear of heights, or revisiting a war zone to treat PTSD, or locked in a small hut as you watch your family and life disappear to motivate change. The result is to connect you to someone else's problem, and thereby a physical reaction to the response. Now, virtual reality is only one part of the puzzle. The rest is good storytelling. So if the goal is to create empathy around Francis's story, I knew I needed to come up with a visual motif to help tell that story. And knowing a little bit about what Francis might have been experiencing, we began discussing this as a journey into darkness. Immediately, we began discussing this as a, as a light and dark type situation. And then we would also further this experience by showing you glimpses of his life before and then take it away. His livestock, his kids, his wife, they showed in visions in this hut. And then as time and the place stretched on, they would fade away. All of this is to give you the opportunity to feel what he felt, which is depression and anxiety. Now, Francis spent two years locked in this hut and was ultimately saved. Francis premiered on April 14th, 2016 at the World Bank in combination with the World Health Organization to effectively bring mental illness out of the shadows and onto the world stage. We showed our film to over 500 finance ministers, multilateral and bilateral organizations, business leaders, technology innovators, and civic leaders. The tool we used to effectively change policy and infuse funding into organizations like Basic Needs and Partners in Health was empathy. The ability to put you in someone else's shoes and have you connect with what he experienced changed the world. But this is the most important part. On October 10th, 2017, this is where we see all of these tools come together. The result is, is so important. October 10th is Mental Health Day. And Ghana's Mental Health Authority announced that they would finally start reducing this uh, shackling ban that had been in place since 2012, and that it would finally be enforced. 
ending this horrible and inhumane treatment. I spent years trying to understand what empathy meant, from my high school letter of recommendation to my father store afternoon therapy sessions to a man who listened to my problems for $20, and finally to a teacher in Ghana who was shackled to a hut. I've come to this. When we fix others, we ultimately fix ourselves. The solution is in helping others. My father taught me the value of tools and how to use them to solve problems, except that now it's not an old lawnmower engine that gets me dreaming of the possibility of flight. It's the use of color and light to escape the world we know and take a journey into someone else's life. All of us have a set of tools we've been given. Through the years, they can evolve, change, and grow. Some might be swapped out for better ones, while others only become more precise. But if you pay attention to the tools you have to offer and never apologize for them, you'll learn to drive that hammer and tighten that bolt, and soon some of you will discover you have the ability to lead and organize teams while some will have the ability to heal and care for the sick. And even some will have the ability to fund and, and help those in need. So use the tools you have to offer. If we use the tools you have to offer, you can change the world through empathy. So pay attention to your tools and fix the things that have meaning for you. I was a problem child growing up who discovered that if I could fix things, I could be the man I always knew I was. And today I'm one step closer to that dream. Thank you.